station. This is United States Coast Guard, St. Petersburg, Florida. The vessel, some adventure, 606 foot, has hit the Skyway Bridge. Any vessels in Tampa Bay area, Skyway vicinity, proceed and assist. There are reports of people in the water. Break, this is United States Coast Guard, St. Petersburg, Florida. Out. What you just heard was the broadcast from the United States Coast Guard Station in St. Petersburg, Florida, on May 9, 1980, notifying all vessels in the Tampa Bay area that the freighter Summit Venture had struck the Skyway Bridge. Today, on Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs, the Summit Venture and the Skyway Bridge. Welcome to Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs. I am Rich Napolitano, your host, and with me today is my guest co-host, Dawn Napolitano. Glad to be here, Rich. Today's story is something that we are both very familiar with, having grown up here in the St. Petersburg, Tampa Bay area. Certainly remember this day as a child. And uh, it's a pretty well-known story here. It's well-documented, and, and many people know it. Outside of this area, though, not so sure, but it, it certainly is a, a, a tragic and, and fascinating story. It would be helpful to start off by making a mental map of the Tampa Bay area. So just picture Florida hanging down off the southeast and then focus on the central west coast. Uh, Pinellas County hangs off and down like a bent finger with Tampa Bay, the, the body of water, to the east. To the south... Tampa Bay opens up into the Gulf of Mexico, with 11 miles of open water separating the southern tip of Pinellas County all the way to Manatee County to the southeast. In 1927, the B-Line Ferry opened to carry passengers and cars across Tampa Bay. The ferry was extremely popular, and locals and tourists both were thrilled to be able to make the trip across the bay, and at its height, a ferry departed every 30 minutes. It was used primarily for leisure travel and tourism but a small percentage also used it for commercial purposes. That's right. By the early 1940s, the Beeline Ferry was not able to meet the demands of all of the traffic across the bay. You know, more people by this time had cars and commercial transportation was becoming heavy. Driving from St. Petersburg up and around the bay and back down to Bradenton was a 70-mile trek and not convenient for daily commutes. So the St. Petersburg Port Authority purchased the Beeline Ferry franchise, which included the rights to the route across the bay. It would continue to operate the ferry, but plans were underway to build a bridge. The original Sunshine Skyway Bridge opened in 1954. It was a $22 million steel cantilever style bridge built by the Virginia Bridge Company. Now, cantilever was something that I had to look up personally. I'm not a architectural or expert or a civil engineer or anything, but cantilever means it was uh, supported, the, the main span anyway, was supported by uh, two sections that were coming off of a pillar, but just on one side. So the main span meets in the middle between these two cantilevers. So that's what that means. I, you know, I just thought it would be good to explain that because uh, I didn't know what it meant. Thank you. Very interesting. So it was built in five sections, uh, including the approaches, and covered a distance of 15 miles. This was quite an undertaking at that time. It required new roads, new causeways, and smaller bridges to help bridge the gap, you know, along the uh, some of the barrier islands and part of the roadway that they were building. Uh, the first section on the St. Petersburg side was built as a drawbridge to allow for smaller boats to pass through to and from Tampa Bay. This original bridge was a two-lane span with one lane going north and one south, so there was no passing. The main center section of the bridge was 864 feet in length and had a clearance of 150 feet above the water. It was a metal grate 
road rather than asphalt, and the water below was visible while driving over it. The bridge was supported by sunken concrete reinforced piers, had no lighting, and was susceptible to swaying in high winds, which are very common here in this area. The Skyway soon developed a somewhat ominous reputation, especially at night. With a 5% grade, actually that's more impressive than it sounds, it made the ascent at night fairly unsettling, and I actually read one account of somebody saying it was almost like just going up into nothing. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Growing up in St. Petersburg, I traveled over that bridge many times, including at night. And I was always uncomfortable going over it. You know, that logic kind of goes out the window. Like, it's going to be fine. Just go over the bridge. But I, I never like going over it. And I still don't like going and over to the this new Skyway day, Bridge. <laughs> yes. The bridge spanned the highly traveled shipping channel with large freighters and cruise ships arriving and departing the Port of Tampa on a daily basis. The channel under the main center section of the bridge was 400 feet wide and could accommodate up to the largest freighters at the time. In 1971, with increasing traffic demands, another identical span was built at a cost of $25 million. The bridge would be part of the new Interstate 275 and therefore had to meet federal regulations of having four lanes. The new span had two southbound lanes and the older span had two northbound lanes. The waters near the Skyway Bridge would experience its share of troubles over the years, as we shall see. On January 28, 1980, just a few months prior to the event that we will be detailing in a bit, uh, in the southern approach to the bridge, the United States Coast Guard cutter Blackthorn collided with the Capricorn, which was a large oil tanker. 23 crew members of the Blackthorn were dragged down to the bottom when the Capricorn's anchor became loose and plunged down into the hull of the Blackthorn. Just a week later, on February 5th, the carrier Thalassini Mana struck the southbound span of the Skyway Bridge as it entered the bay. It suffered some minor damage, uh, and there were no casualties, thankfully. It also wouldn't be the last ship to strike the southbound span. The Summit Venture was built in 1976 in Nagasaki, Japan, by the Oshima Shipbuilding Company. Originally owned by Hercules Carriers, the ship operated under the Liberian flag. It was 186 meters long, 26 meters wide, and 33,912 tons. That's a, that's a big ship. It was considered a modern freighter and was designed to carry cargoes of dry goods. The Sum Adventure was very well-traveled, having already been to the Gulf of Mexico, Korea, Japan, and through the Panama Canal. When you were talking about how the Skyway had been struck previously, I recall an interview uh, that I listened to with a couple of DOT workers that were divers Hmm. and worked all over the state inspecting the bridges. Uh, And they'd been doing this prior to when the Skyway got hit. Um, and they were able to see, you know, every time that they had to go out and inspect the bridge, those a remainder of some of that damage. So some of the damage was not able to be repaired or perhaps just didn't need to be repaired, but they could see some chunks out of the concrete. It's interesting. So, yeah, that is interesting. So they saw remaining damage from the Thalassini Mana striking it? Yes, The crew of the Summit Venture were experienced Chinese and Taiwanese seamen and were commanded by Captain Lu Song Chu, a veteran captain who was retired from the Chinese Navy. However, he had only been to the Port of Tampa one time before. On May 6, 1980, at approximately 4.30 a.m., the Summit Venture arrived at the mouth of Tampa Bay after stopping in Houston to unload its cargo. She was kept offshore at Anchorage for three days while she waited her turn to enter the channel and proceed to the port of Tampa. As is the custom for most ports, local harbor pilots are sent to guide the large freighters through the channel and to the port. Harbor pilots know the local area and its conditions and its nooks and crannies, so the harbor pilot assigned to some adventure was Captain John E. Laro. Laro was a veteran harbor pilot, having guided over 800 vessels through the Gulf of Mexico and through the Tampa Bay shipping channel. 
He had diligently worked his way up through the ranks to deputy harbor pilot and had been assigned to take freighters to Japan, Europe, and South America. In May of 1980, he was scheduled to receive the rank of full harbor pilot. At 4.30 a.m. the next day on May 9th, Laro arrived at the Tampa Bay Pilot Station on Egmont Key. From here, he could see the summit venture and nearby Mullet Key through a light mist. Laro then contacted the captain of the summit venture via VHF radio for a visibility report and received a message back stating, quote, something negative. Still gathering information, he instructed the summit venture to remain at anchor and wait for further instructions. Laro then checked the scheduled traffic in the channel that morning to plan the best timing and route for the summit venture. The tugboat Dixie Progress was also in the area, headed inbound, and its captain gave Laro a visibility report of about three to four miles, so that's, uh, that's pretty good. Being satisfied that the visibility was adequate, he contacted the summit venture again and instructed the captain to begin moving the ship inbound, but to keep north of the channel to avoid outbound traffic. What did it mean, do you think, when he said that the message he got was something negative? No, that's a good question. Uh, my take on that is that the message back from the summit venture was either vague or perhaps not quite understandable. It was a Chinese crew, even though the captain did speak English. That's what was in the reports that Laro received a message back stating, quote, something negative. So what exactly that was, I don't know. Possibly poor visibility, but the Dixie Progress reported that the visibility was about three to four miles. So that is a good question and a mm. little bit of a mystery. Was the tugboat out there by the summit venture? Yes. Okay. So knowing that at around 5.43 a.m., the summit venture raised its anchor and began to slowly move inbound toward the channel. A little over 30 minutes later, Lero and pilot trainee Bruce Atkins boarded the summit venture where they were met by the ship's second mate and escorted to the bridge of the ship, not the Skyway Bridge. <laughs> After a few inspections of the navigational equipment, Lero assumed command of the freighter and at 6.30 ordered the ship to move ahead at half speed, approximately five and a half knots, and entered the channel between buoys one and two. So just for informational purposes, Buoy markers in the area are increasing as they get closer to the bridge, but once they're at the bridge, they start over again, uh, appended with the letter A. So then it would be 1A, 2A, etc. Still heading inbound was the tugboat Dixie Progress, which was experiencing a severe rain squall and was having trouble with its radar. The Summit Venture contacted the tug and guided her toward buoy marker 8. The tug captain then agreed to let the summit venture overtake her. At 6.50 a.m., pilot and training Atkins ordered full ahead at 11 knots. By the time the summit venture reached buoy marker 8, the rain squall had dissipated and visibility improved. At this time, the summit venture passed the outbound ship Good Sailor, and the two ships contacted each other and exchanged navigational information. Visibility at this time was still about three miles. As the vessel passed through buoys, 13 and 14, Lero himself spotted and verified buoy marker 13, confirming his location. By 721, the weather had suddenly worsened with gale winds and pelting rain. So Lero took over for trainee Atkins at this time. After passing through channel markers 15 and 16, the ship was blasted by a gust of heavy winds and rain which caused it to unknowingly veer off course. Visuals of the next set of channel markers, which now would be 1A and 2A, were lost, so we're getting close to the bridge at this point. Captain Lero still could spot them on radar, though, so he continued through the channel and toward the bridge. Yeah, the, the situation at this point was, was starting to get troublesome because the visibility was decreasing rapidly. And Laro knew that he was going to have to stay in the channel, especially since he was getting close to the bridge. Right. Uh, and thankfully, he could still see them on radar. The rain and winds intensified even further, and the channel markers disappeared from the radar. Atkins reported seeing the buoys appear on the radar just for a split second, but it wasn't enough information to really rely on. Locating buoys 1A and 2A was critical 
for passing under the bridge safely and staying in the channel because they were the final set of buoys that all the ships had to pass through before the bridge, and this is inbound. And more importantly, right after those buoys, all ships had to make a hard turn to port in order to stay in the channel. So buoys 1A and 2A lined up directly with buoys 3A and 4A on the other side of the bridge, forming the 400-foot wide cut A that went directly under the center span of the bridge. So Laro reduced his engines to half ahead and adjusted his course to compensate for the strong current and winds from the southwest, basing this course on his last knowledge of the buoy markers on the radar. Winds picked up to over 70 miles an hour near hurricane strength. It was determined later that the summit venture had been blasted by a dangerous microburst, which is a localized column of sinking air inside of a thunderstorm. Uh, and this often results in very damaging heavy winds and even hail and rain. At this time, he is still not aware that the ship was pushed off course. Unable to see out of the bridge windows and with radar lost, the summit venture was blind. Lero ordered a lookout on the starboard side of the ship to attempt to spot the buoys. Um, starboard, so this would be on the right-hand side of the ship. As a further precaution, he also ordered the crew to make ready to drop anchor. However, even with reduced speed and a dropped anchor, it would take over a mile to stop a ship of this size. The lookout reported seeing the buoy off the starboard bow, but did not provide any details to let Lero know at what angle they were approaching it or at what distance. Lero made a judgment call and decided the buoy must have been about 50 feet or less off the bow. He ordered a 10-degree turn to port, which would be required when passing through these buoys. However, the lookout did not provide accurate information as the buoy by that time was already past the port side and the ship was veering out of the channel. Yeah, so essentially here, he just doesn't have information. He can't see. Visibility is zero. The buoys are no longer on radar. And he is just trying to really use uh, an educated guess as to where he is based on the very little information that he's gotten. And unfortunately, that uh, guess was not right. He was not in the channel. And at 731, Captain Laro still believed he was on the correct course and ordered engines slowed even more to slow ahead. With the summit venture unknowingly off course and with visibility extremely limited, the Sunshine Skyway Bridge finally came into view. Now, can you imagine being on the ship and heavy fog and it's stormy and you don't really you don't know where you're going. And then all of a sudden, this giant bridge just appears in front of you. No, it's this sense of dread and panic. Yes. Uh, Your stomach is just going to drop right out. So at this time, the Summit Venture was only about 500 feet away from a support pier and heading straight for it. At 734, Laro ordered full astern, anchors dropped, and a turn hard to port. But it was too late. Just a few moments later, the Summit Venture rammed into Pier 2S of the southbound span of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge. We're going to drop anchor here just for a moment for a sponsor break. The center span of the bridge and its supports immediately collapsed, with some of the twisted steel crashing onto the ship's bow. The support pier was completely demolished by the starboard side of the summit venture and crumbled down into the channel. In total, a 1,297-foot section of the bridge collapsed into the channel 100 feet below. Laro immediately sent a mayday message. We have the audio of that message here. And just a warning, the audio is not great, 
but you can definitely hear the panic and distress in Lara's voice. Vessel calling Mayday, vessel in distress. This is United States Coast Guard, St. Petersburg, Florida. Request your position, nature of distress, and number of persons on board. Over. This is great. All the with very low visibility from the rain and fog, motorists on the bridge just couldn't see the collapsed bridge up ahead. Some probably felt the jolt, but nobody would ever imagine that the bridge had been struck by a ship and fallen into the bay. An ambulance driver, Jay Hirsch, later said, I thought at first it was thunder. Then something hit the bridge so hard it knocked my car out of its lane. I kept going until I got across. When I looked back, I saw it. My God, the bridge had gone down. <sighs> Yeah, so I he can't must imagine. have been yeah. just across on the other side, just going on uh, the other side, going the... downward on the on the other slope. Yeah, and looking back and seeing that the bridge was gone that that must have been terrifying. I just had a chill go down my back. Yeah. Another driver, Donald Albritton, saw through the fog headlights disappearing downward in front of him, and uh, he saw the bridge actually just twisting and plummeting downward. So he stopped, put his car in reverse, and was trying to signal other motorists to stop. He was putting his hands out the window, trying to warn everybody to stop. He saw three cars and a Greyhound bus speed past him. And those cars and the bus all wound up plunging off the bridge and into the water. The Greyhound bus carried 26 people, and none of them survived. An additional six cars and one pickup truck dropped off the broken span, killing an additional nine people. The youngest of the dead was only seven years old. The oldest was 92. Horrific. Gosh. The sole survivor was the driver of a pickup truck, 56-year-old Wesley McIntyre. He was on his way to work as usual at a meat delivery business. McIntyre describes his experience as this. As I went up to the top of the bridge, the center part where the grading work was, the pickup started to bob up and down. At the time, I thought it was just the wind blowing up through the bridge or something like that made it blow around. But then I started to drop over a high part, and at this point I looked, and there I seen the ship, and I knew what had happened. I hit my brakes, but I guess the truck wasn't even on the bridge anymore. I was in the air, probably, and the only thing I remember is saying, Oh, God, and I felt a thud, which I believe or thought maybe I hit, bounced off the ship or something. After that, I just remember sinking in the water. McIntyre found himself in his mangled truck on the bottom of the shipping channel. Thankfully, he was trained as a swimmer in the Navy. He somehow was able to free himself from the truck and swim 40 feet or so to the surface. He then was able to grab onto a steel structure from the broken bridge that was protruding from the water. Crew members on the summit venture saw him and were able to rescue him. Amazingly, he suffered only a small cut on his head and some salt water in his lungs. Providence was with him that day. Yeah, uh, his account of driving off the bridge and, and just not understanding what was happening, you know, hitting the brakes and, and thinking, whoa, what's going on? That is something that sticks with me because I just have this terrible and I guess irrational fear of plummeting off the end of a bridge. <laughs> and I just can't even, it just makes my, my stomach drop and my skin crawl thinking about what that must have been like. I'm sure his adrenaline kicked into overdrive and he just went into survival mode. Yeah, I'm sure. And it's hard to think of how you would react in a situation like that until it happens. Well, another driver, Richard Hornbuckle, had four passengers with him. And he was able to stop just inches from the dangling roadway, which was angled down toward the water. 
and they were able to scramble out of the car and escape. And there are photos that famously documented this, this car that was just about to plunge off into the water. And uh, after this escape, he noticed that all of the car doors, all four of the car doors were still open. So he and one of the other passengers actually ran back to the car on this <laughs> sloped, angled edge of the road, got the keys and closed all the doors before getting away again. And Hornbuckle later said, it seems crazy now, but at the time, I kept thinking my car would blow away if the doors were open. I know. I know. You just, you're not thinking rationally. I mean, something horrific has just happened. You <laughs> barely escape your car with your life, but you feel compelled to run back and put things back in order. <laughs> and it's almost so unbelievable that this has happened if you're in that situation, you know, the bridge just disappearing in front of you. Yeah. But I have to say, if I was in that car and I saw the water down below and I'm on, you know, I don't know what it was, about a 20 to 25 degree angle sloping down, there is no way I'm running back toward that. <laughs> There's oh. no way. No chance. No how. But you can see a photo of this car, of Hornbuckle's car, in this episode's show notes. Now, the tugboat Dixie Progress, which the Summit Venture had passed earlier, heard the distress call on the VHF radio. And the captain of the tugboat swiftly anchored his barge, and the tug was the first vessel to assist in the rescue efforts. Here's the transmission from the Dixie Progress. At this point, another harbor pilot was sent to the Summit Venture to relieve Captain John Lero. The Summit Venture was not badly damaged. However, a tank in its bow was taking on water. The Dixie Progress and another tug, the Bradenton, ended up pulling the Summit Venture back away from the bridge at approximately noon. Uh, she was later hauled to the Tampa Shipyard dry dock for repairs before it continued on to Japan. The rescue efforts, I know, involved many ships, many uh, local ships that were in the area, some Coast Guard ships. Um, you happened to listen to a podcast that talked about this disaster and some additional divers that were in the area that tried to help with the rescue. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, this was the Concrete podcast. Um, it was back in 2020, so we're looking at the 40-year anniversary of the event. Two DOT divers were interviewed for the podcast, Robert Rayola and Mike Betts. They worked all over the state inspecting bridges and and of course, the Sunshine Skyway was one of the many bridges they had to inspect, and they were very familiar with it. So they heard the emergency call uh, that the Skyway had been hit, and so they went out there. They found some divers from Ecker College trying to rescue people out of the water. So I don't know if those were professional divers or student divers, but the proximity to the Skyway uh, was very helpful that they got out there right away, and they joined in the the rescue effort, the uh, Robert and Mike, and uh, they were able to pull uh, many of the people out of the water, uh, especially from that Greyhound bus. So they recovered a lot of people out of the bus. I'm not sure if they were able to recover all of them themselves before they uh, were relieved by the Coast Guard, but between them and the student divers from Eckerd College, they, they were able to recover a lot of the victims that day. And it was a very harrowing experience for them. It was, uh, and for everybody who was there, it was very emotional. Well, you know, a little bit more about the aftermath and the, the rescue efforts. Uh, the, the two columns and the cap of Pier Number 2S of the bridge were completely destroyed. They were sheared off 20 feet above the water surface. Pier 1S was still standing, but had major cracks and other damage. And a 100-foot steel section of the bridge actually crashed down on the bow of the Summit Venture, causing just some minor damage. 
rescue efforts by local authorities sprung into action. But unfortunately, out of the 36 people who went into the water, 35 of them died. 26 of them, including the bus driver, died on the Greyhound bus. The roof of the Greyhound bus was found to be completely torn away, caused by the nose dive as it impacted the water. The force of the impact, I think, is what caused most people's death, falling from such a, a distance and at such speed hitting the water. So Wesley McIntyre's pickup truck, possibly bouncing off the summit venture, might have helped save him that day by reducing his speed a little bit before the truck hit the water. Oh, absolutely. I'm sure it did help. He was, unfortunately, the only survivor that day. By the end of the day, 18 bodies had been recovered by divers. Workers at nearby Fort DeSoto Park transformed the fishing pier into a makeshift moor to aid in the efforts. This location served the same purpose just four months earlier for the victims of the Blackthorn. Eventually, all 35 bodies would be found and identified. The NTSB, or the National Transportation Safety Board, began their investigation, and of course, most of the focus was on John Laro. Meanwhile, he was holed up in a hotel with his family, just trying to avoid the public and the media. He was unfortunately accused of being an alcoholic and of being drunk on the job. None of these allegations were true. His license was suspended temporarily pending the investigation. The severity of the weather, the strength of the wind, the visibility, and John Laro's actions were of particular concern. The captain of the Pure Oil, a ship headed outbound at the same time, testified that they were in a vicious thunder rain squall and the wind changed almost instantaneous from a light breeze to 50 to 60 miles per hour. Harbor pilot in training Atkins stated, the winds were in excess of 60 knots and explained he had been in winds such as this plenty of times, but never have they come on so suddenly. Laro added, there was a large degree of sliding due to the wind. I'm sure the vessel moved laterally. I figured she'd make the center span. It's hard to hear that quote from him. Yeah. Just that he was sure that the vessel moved laterally. Yeah, and he knew that because of the direction of the wind and the current. Yeah. But he still thought he could make it. He still mm -hmm. thought he was in the channel so that he would make it. Investigation into the Summit Ventures navigation equipment revealed no issues. On December 24th, Judge Chris Bentley, chief judge for the state of Florida Division of Administrative Hearings, ruled that Laro did not act negligently and did act reasonably under the circumstances. On March 5th, 1981, so almost a year later, the State Board of Pilot Commissioners unanimously exonerated Captain Laro, saying the state had failed to refute expert witnesses who testified that Laro indeed made a prudent decision to approach the bridge. Finally, on April 10, 1981, 11 months after the accident, the NTSB voted 3-2 to two that Lyra was at least partially responsible and released its findings. Of the 24 findings recorded, seven of them described an instance with Lyra at fault. The most damning of the findings were the pilot's decision to attempt to navigate the summit venture through the channel and under the Skyway Bridge after visual and radar navigational references were lost 0.2 nautical miles west of Buoy 2A was not a reasonable and prudent decision. Also, the summit venture probably would not have struck the Sunshine Skyway Bridge if the pilot had turned the vessel hard to starboard immediately upon the loss of navigational information on the radar. So I'm picturing that, you know, he was partially out of the channel and couldn't see the buoy. So the best move at that point is turning hard starboard, which would be to the right, and then the ship would have ended up parallel to the bridge and out of harm's way. Yeah, had he turned starboard at that point, he would have had time to turn the ship completely to the right become parallel to the bridge and either slow down completely or 
uh, head back out into open water, but he would have been out of the channel, but it would have given him time to avoid hitting the bridge. Yeah. But of course he didn't know that because he couldn't see the bridge. Right. It's wouldn't have been prudent to try to continue to move the ship anywhere, but I think hard to starboard slow and stop and just wait for the squall to pass. But that's the benefit of hindsight. The National Weather Service was also blamed by the NTSB, stating that the National Weather Service forecasts pertinent to the time and place of the accident were substantially in error. Many deficiencies were also found, including inadequate protective structures around the piers of the bridge, inadequate buoy markers, and a lack of any warning systems from the bridge, such as lights or signals to warn drivers to stop. Well, we have been hijacked by capitalist pirates, so we are being forced to take an ad break. The Coast Guard's own investigation report put some of the blame on Captain Liu, stating, The master of the summit venture did not fully exercise his responsibilities for the safe conduct of his vessel, in that he expressed no concerns to the pilot when he did, in fact, have misgivings during the transit through Mullet Key Channel. In response, Captain Liu, who spoke English fluently, reported that navigating the channel is, quote, one man's job and he should not intervene with the harbor pilot unless he was aware of a problem. He was not aware of the ship's exact position at the time. And that's typical, wouldn't you say? You know, you can only have one captain. That's right. There's one captain, and you can only have one person commanding a ship. So for him to jump in really would have only been necessitated by something pretty severe, uh, some kind of imminent danger that he was aware of. Now, of course, Captain Lou is not familiar with this channel, not familiar with navigating to the port of Tampa. So he didn't know. I mean, obviously the weather was bad and there's a bridge up ahead, but I'm not sure why he would interfere with the harbor pilot that knows the waters and knows the channel. So my personal opinion is that Captain Lou really had no uh, culpability. No culpability whatsoever in this, that it was, he was letting the harbor pilot do his job, as, and it's what he should have done. NTSB Chairman James B. King released the following statement with the official report. After a careful review of the events of the day, I don't feel we can hold the pilot responsible to the degree implied in the majority's probable cause. The pilot recognized that there was an element of risk associated with each available navigational alternative and felt that the least risk maneuver was to attempt to navigate through the channel and under the Skyway Bridge. There was no bright line for decision making. He acted reasonably in the situation in which he found himself. And I think that's a valid opinion because it really was a uh, perfect storm, so to speak. Captain Laro didn't know exactly what was happening. He couldn't see, he had no radar. You know, he didn't ram the bridge on purpose. He wasn't drunk. He, he uh, was an unfortunate player in this set of circumstances that, it, that really was caused by the weather and nothing else. Well, he also had somebody less experienced on the bridge with him. Possibly he didn't get accurate information from that person, uh, which led to the poor decision that he ended up making. The NTSB investigation resulted in 17 recommendations to improve the safety of the ships navigating the channel, the motorists using the bridge, and the structure of the bridge itself. However, these recommendations did not include revoking Laro's pilot license. Lara was crushed with survivor's guilt and suffered from severe depression for the remainder of his life. He would forever be haunted by this accident and the deaths of the 35 people. Although legally exonerated and his pilot license reinstated, many people in the community still thought he was guilty and considered him to be at fault. Laro did resume piloting ships, but a year later he was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis and was forced to retire from piloting. He landed at SUNY Maritime College, briefly teaching classes and living in very cramped quarters aboard the teaching vessel Empire State, which was docked under a bridge. While teaching cadets, he would quip, if you misjudge, 
you've got hell to pay. He described this time in his life as living like an animal because he could not afford housing. He moved back to Tampa where his MS began taking its toll. He said, it's a miserable existence. I spent thousands of hours thinking about that day, thousands of hours trying to figure out why me. You know what the answer is? Because. Why me? Because. Why the poor souls who died? Because. In other words, no answers. If I had life to do over again, I'd be a flute player. You know, this just smacks of somebody that is obviously suffering mental illness. His depression had completely taken over. Plus, he had physical uh, ailments with the MS. But, you know, you can you can look at this and say, oh, he's just feeling sorry for himself. Get over it. But it's not that's not how mental illness works. You can't just snap out of it. You don't just flip a switch and stop thinking about it. No. And if I had to characterize it, I would characterize it as post-traumatic stress. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good point. I mean. It's more like PTSD. Yes. Yeah, you're right. Um, but even, you know, that too, it's not something that you just switch on or switch off. It's, no. it's not doing it on purpose. You can't just cheer up. You can't no, just you, snap you relive those moments yeah. for the rest of your life. Well, he attempted to come to terms with this situation and he did try not to blame himself. He, he would say, you know, I know it's not my fault, but you know, that proved to be difficult. He said, piloting was beautiful. Piloting was wonderful but the bridge was the antithesis of piloting. It was a screw up. And there it is for all the world to see. It was the storm and the wrong decision. The radar was out. The visuals were out. I ought to have put the ship aground. I was between the devil and the deep blue sea. That's what I have to live with now. So his survivor guilt and depression were made worse when he and his wife divorced. Although he did uh, later enroll at the University of South Florida in Tampa, earned a master's degree in counseling, and he volunteered for a crisis hotline counseling victims of trauma and others who were contemplating suicide. So he really did do something positive with the life that he had after this accident. He managed to uh, remarry, and he lived a quiet life in Tampa, but he never did recover from the guilt of the accident. And he died in 2002 at age 59. The State of Florida Department of Transportation, uh, survivor Wesley McIntyre, and families of the victims ended up suing the ship's owner, Hercules Carriers. Hercules claimed they were not at fault since the Tampa Bay Harbor pilot was operating the ship at the time. In 1983, now three years after the accident, the United States District Court ruled that Hercules Carriers, Inc. was liable, not entitled to any protections. Survivor Wesley McIntyre was awarded a judgment of $175,000. Wrongful death claims paid out to families averaged about $300,000. The state of Florida was awarded $19 million for damages, which helped offset some of the cost of a new bridge. Most of the broken debris was cleared, but the southbound span of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge remained in place for 13 years. Just this eerie reminder of that faithful day. Many in the area refused to drive over the northbound and unbroken span, not trusting that it was undamaged. Motorists crossing the bridge could look over and see the ghostly visage of the broken span. Yeah, you know, I, I personally did that many times after the the bridge was struck and and broken um looking over at the broken span you know right where the roadway ends <laughs> and was just wondering what it must have been like on that day or having been on the bridge or even you know one of the people that unfortunately went into the water uh it really was a a, a, a eerie ominous feeling when you're driving over the those span that was not broken and looking over and seeing this broken bridge. Um, and that's why a lot of people didn't want to drive over it. Just was a bad feeling and, and a little bit uh, fearful of the other bridge being damaged. Well, the new Sunshine Skyway Bridge opened in 1987 at a cost of $244 million. 
So uh, that's a little bit, just a touch more than the $19 million that the state was awarded in damages, but they did build a brand new bridge instead of repairing the old one. So I guess, you know, there is that. Right. And compare that to the original Skyway. Yeah. I mean, this is only seven years after the accident. So we're not talking about, you know, inflation increased the cost to $244 million. That's just what it cost. Yeah. To build it the way it needed to be built with all of the safety features that it needed as well. Anyway, the new bridge is bigger and it's a suspension bridge and um, they widen the channel. So it has a 1200 foot main span and it's 180 feet above the water. So that's uh, 30 feet higher than the old bridge. Many of the NTSB recommendations were also put into place. Protective concrete structures called dolphins were installed around every pier and the channel was doubled in width to over 800 feet. The old bridge was finally officially closed. Wesley McIntyre and his wife were the last people to drive over the old bridge, and at the top, they stopped, got out, and dropped 35 white carnations into the water. That's, mm, that's a touching tribute. That's very touching, very yeah. nice. He probably wasn't thrilled to be on the bridge, but he yeah. did it anyway. It makes you wonder if he had a little survivor guilt. Like, why me? Why oh, did I survive? I did read a little bit more about him, and he did have survivor guilt. Oh, that's he did. terrible. He never really uh, resumed working in any meaningful way after that. Um, and he died of bone cancer just two years later in 1989. The original Skyway Bridge was carefully demolished in 1993 and hauled away in barges. The approaches to the bridge were left in place though and were converted into the world's longest fishing pier as still in use today. The Summit Venture continued operating under Liberian license and was sold in 1993 to Sailor Maritime Limited of Malta. It was renamed the Sailor and then renamed again to KS Harmony when it was bought by the Singapore Group Frontier SG. In 2008, she was purchased by Shang Jang International of Singapore and renamed the Jean Mao 9. In 2010, the freighter was lost off the coast of Vietnam with no loss of life. Yeah, the, the former Summit Venture was lost uh, in the Pacific Ocean, and um, it was probably due to poor weather, uh, high seas, but uh, from what I read about it, there wasn't really a clear cause of the loss, but uh, at least nobody uh, died when that ship was lost. But that was the ultimate fate of the Summit Venture. It is lying in the bottom of the ocean. 30 years after it hit the bridge. Yeah. Bill DeYoung, author of Skyway, the true story of Tampa Bay's signature bridge and the man who brought it down, spearheaded a frustrating campaign to get a memorial built to honor the victims of the tragedy. After many frustrations and after recruiting private donors, though, a monument was placed at the north end of the bridge in St. Petersburg on May 9, 2015, 35 years to the day of the accident. A photo of that monument, which bears the names of all the victims, can be viewed in the show notes. On a personal note, I was a young boy living in South St. Petersburg at the time, and uh, I lived very close to the Skyway Bridge, actually. I could see it from the park where I used to play and ride around with my friends on our bikes. I remember getting up to go to school that morning of May 9th, 1980, and my mom was listening to the radio like she usually did, but she was crying. She was really upset, and it was raining really hard. It was really stormy and windy. And my mom told me that the Skyway Bridge had collapsed. And uh, she just said, you can stay home from school. We really didn't know the details of, of what happened until later that day. But, uh, you know, it was just a, a really strange feeling that day. It was just had a bad feeling overall. So that's the story of the Sunshine Skyway Bridge and the Sum Adventure. Thank you so much to my guest host today, Don Napolitano. You're welcome. I'm sure we'll be having you on the show much more. <laughs> Thank you so much to you, our listeners. I appreciate each and every one of you. Shipwrecks and Sea Dogs is written, produced, and edited by me, Rich Napolitano. 
And our outstanding original theme music is by Sean Siegfried, and you can follow him on YouTube at Sean Secret. Please remember to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Also, help us out by rating and reviewing the show. For you iPhone folks, please rate and review on Apple Podcasts. And for everyone else, you can rate and review us on podchaser.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at ShipwrecksPod and visit us on the web at shipwrecksandseadogs.com. And please help conserve the world's oceans by limiting the use of plastics. It's time to cut and run. We'll see you on the next episode. Bye.